So I wanted to just quickly start by giving each of you a chance to talk a little bit about your respective companies and, and product suites and how today you're leveraging automation to enhance consumer experiences. Amelia, why don't you start us off? Uh, my name is Amelia Powell, and I'm with a company called USA Technologies. We uh, specialize in small ticket unattended transactions with a footprint of over 850,000 point of sales across the US ranging in um, profile from a vending machine to an amusement game. You'll find our equipment in laundry, in parking, on kiosks all over the world, as well as um, in micromarkets. So we specialize in consumer engagement at the point of sale, helping to make sure that consumers have a great digital experience when they make a sale, and then giving them the ability to leverage all the technology on the back, back end to uh, complete the life cycle of fulfillment, as well as um, consumer engagement. I'm Joe Ziemer. I'm with Betterment. We're an online financial advisor. We've been around for about seven and a half years. Currently, we serve a little over 300,000 clients, and we manage about $12 billion for them. So when customers come to Betterment, uh, they tell us about their financial lives all online, what their financial goals are, what their financial situation looks like. And based on that set of criteria, we recommend goals and portfolios for each of those goals. Uh, the majority of the business is direct to consumer, but we do have two B2B lines as well. And I'm Jeff Bender with uh, Diebold Nixdorf, uh, Vice President of Digital Solutions. Um, many of you may not be familiar with Diebold, but uh, we're a $5 billion company focused on delivering connected commerce solutions across both uh, financial services and retail. So we have uh, an installed base of over 1 million what I'll call customer touch points around the world, including self-service devices, ATMs, kiosks, and the like, as well as uh, digital solutions that we deliver to our clients and to their customers. Great. So Obviously, you've relied on automation to date to help get you to, to where you are today. What, what's next? What are some of the new um, automations you're working on today that, that are going to enhance the next generation of the consumer products and, and B2B products that you're offering? You know, from a, a digital standpoint, we see, you know, obviously everyone is focused on delivering unique digital experiences through mobile devices. One thing we see just an incredible adoption of is, is voice as, an interact, as a way to interact. So from a, um, an adoption standpoint, it's hard to ignore you know, what Amazon has done with Echo, what Google has done with, with Google Home. And you know, consumers have really embraced this as a technology. So um, you know, there was just an article published just a few days ago, actually, I think when Google was talking about they sold an <coughs> Echo device you know, every second. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it's just incredible, tens of millions of, of, of devices being sold. So as a, a company, we need to start looking at how do we integrate those types of same frictionless types of experiences into the digital experiences that our customers expect. So if you think about today a mobile app, and if I want to launch my mobile app and find out, you know, hey, how much should I spend on groceries this month? But I've got to launch the app, I've got to log in, I've got to basically you know, click to the, the right page on, on my, my financial spending, select the right categories and the like. You know, through, through voice, I can remove all that friction. I can just say, hey, how much did I spend on groceries last month? And it'll spit back $400, right? So those types of things, I think, are critically important to that customer experience, and we're seeing massive adoption of, of that today. Yep. So for us, uh, right now, we handle some financial planning. We'll, we'll give you a great retirement plan on how you can reach that goal. We see a world where we do a lot more financial planning for you and give you more guidance in your financial life with the end goal being that we would ultimately be the recipient of your paycheck and we would automatically allocate it into the optimal account and then we would automatically pay your bills out of the optimal account as well. All of that is very doable. It's just certainly going to take some time. From our perspective, we're, we're very fortunate in that we're working with um, emerging technologies like uh, point of sale uh, retail, such as the automated vending machines, they can do things like analyze the dwell time of customers as they come up to machines, understand uh, who's purchasing and why, and we have the power to deliver additional information at the point of sale that wouldn't ever be possible before. So, for instance, if you are interested in buying a soda or a snack, you can get the nutritional information right at the point of sale. And then afterwards, you can be incentivized uh, through loyalty and consumer engagement to come back or, or you know, get rewarded for your purchases and things like that. Yep. Are you starting to see consumers actually take advantage of those capabilities? Is that, 
you know, is it incumbent on the retailers to continue to market those opportunities more? As it, as it becomes easier and easier for retailers to serve up that type of information, we do find that consumers are using it more often. So we have a large installed base of interactive devices that allow consumers, as I said before, to get the nutritional information at the point of view or at the point of sale. We have found that in certain locations, colleges and universities, uh, hospitals, things like that. There are targeted populations that are particularly interested in that type of information. And again, as technology evolves, these old-fashioned vending machines that you used to see are changing into uh, air screen coolers that can be filled with anything from t-shirts to uh, cosmetics and products where a consumer could potentially pick it up, get questions answered about um, the product itself, and then walk away with a very seamless um, purchasing experience. Got it. Jeff, you, you mentioned a little bit about um, customers now using their banking apps for commerce and purchases. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so banks are struggling, right? They want to try and make sure they have a very sticky uh, consumer experience, right? That's driving a lot of value for customers as well. So one thing we're starting to see is kind of this merge of, you know, the kind of the financial services functionality along with things like retail functionality. So A, you know, if I have a ton of information, as was mentioned by Amelia, about my consumer, I can deliver more relevant information to them. But what we're also seeing is like the integration of things like affiliate networks into a re, uh, you know, retail affiliate network into a banking application. So as a consumer, I inherently trust my bank and I can actually purchase a product from a, a retail outlet, like say a Gap, I can make a payment directly from within my bank. And now what I'm also doing is I'm, I'm creating a new revenue stream for that banking institution as well. So now they can get a finder's fee, click through revenue and the like off of those types of capabilities. So again, really trying to deliver highly relevant customer experiences through, through one central point. Yeah, Joe, um, in terms of consumer adoption, I, I think mm -hmm you may have one of the hardest challenges of, of getting people and convincing them to essentially give you their, their yeah. retirement money and to, to manage on their behalf. And I think, you know, historically people have been a little bit skeptical about some of these new services. Can you talk about how you've overcome that and how consumers are now making the leap to yeah. um, robo-advisors? So we get about a third of our customers today from referral, uh, which kind of has some built-in trust if you're getting recommended back <coughs> from a friend or a family family member. Outside of that, I think there's a few things that, that we have done. Uh, first, we make a very direct effort to not overpromise. Uh, that's as far as returns. We're willing to tell customers that we might not be the right fit for them uh, if they're seeking a different type of investing experience. Uh, we deliver a lot of content as well to, to make sure that customers know that we're paying attention to what they want as far as the product feedback, things of that nature. Customer support. We know that we're not going to have a lot of times to personally interact with our customers. We look to deliver a really great experience there as well. Uh, Consumer Reports named us best in the category. I think the flip side of that, too, is that Edelman does a survey every year, the trust survey. And basically, every single year, financial services is dead last. Uh, it's basically 2008, 2009 levels. There's some improvement there, but, but not much. But the most trusted category is technology, which push, puts us kind of at an interesting crossroads since we're a technology company that is in financial services. And I think a lot of people are looking for for a new provider in their financial life. I think one thing that everybody keeps bringing up that's really important is this frictionless experience mm -hmm. and the consumer experience itself. And, and that's a really great point. Like as, as the population becomes more and more accustomed to technology, they expect more from technology. They want the, the advisors and the machines to be able to anticipate <coughs> their needs and their desires and kind of get out in front of that. And that's, that's the really beautiful thing about technology because it can really complement these retail interactions in a new way. I think, Definitely. I think I mean, the, the other aspect that plays to that too is speed, right? So for the institutions out there, right, they've got to innovate very, very quickly because it's changing so fast. So you know, today we might integrate you know, a certain capability to do natural language processing for voice, right? But tomorrow, we don't, we don't know what that best in class service is going to be. Right? So we need the ability to actually quickly and easily kind of integrate those new technologies so that we can keep up with the consumer demand and deliver those capabilities they want. Completely. I mean, we, we see that in the, in the media industry. So um, we're a you know, company that publishes magazines, has, owns digital assets, and, and runs TV stations. And I, I don't know that there's been another industry more than media that's been disrupted by automation. First, automation of delivery of content, and now increasingly the monetization of that content, but 
One thing we know for sure, and you see particularly the bigger companies talk about this all the time, Google, Facebook, et cetera, speed. That consumers want it easy. And we all know when you get to a website and you're waiting 30 seconds for that site to load, you leave and, and you're always one click away from that next site. And so creating a great consumer experience is now, I think, more important than ever. Um, it's probably hard to talk about automation without mentioning AI. And so I wanted to, to hear if you guys are starting to leverage AI in any way to improve your products. And I think you know, one thing I'll mention about this is that um, I don't think they're necessarily synonymous. Uh, you know, creating a, um, you, you know, you, the way we do it today is people create a workflow and you kind of wor work through that workflow and you create a decision tree. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's AI driven. We all know this when we call up a customer service center and you go through the options and inevitably 75% of the time you end up talking to an agent anyway because you have some sort of edge case that wasn't considered by that original workflow. So I'm curious to hear if how you guys think about the future of automation and, and whether or not you're truly leveraging AI to help get there. <clears throat> AI is a huge part of our industry actually and it has been for a long time. Um, in self-serve unattended retail, um, remember that 25 years ago, the only tool that uh, retailers really had was merchandising to drive people to the point of sale. And then they basically had to guess how many of each product was purchased at that time. Um, through the recent acquisition of Cantaloupe Systems, USA Technologies has traditionally excelled and been the market leader in um, driving top line sales and payment innovation. Cantaloupe Systems, our, our company that we are recently acquired, is um, experts in optimization. So what we're able to do now is create a full ecosystem for the unattended retail space that allows us to make sure that from the point of sale, there's instant cloud-based data going back to the owners of the machines that say this item was purchased, this needs to be put on this truck, and this needs to be delivered at this time. Making sure that the fulfillment process all the way through the cycle happens quickly, easily, and frictionless. For us in our space, uh, a lot of companies, I think, insinuate the use of AI, uh, but it's effectively just currently marketing jargon. It's, it's the new big data. Nobody's <laughs> actually deploying uh, any real AI. We're certainly laying the groundwork. It's certainly part of the future, uh, especially more on a machine learning front. But basically, the, the entire space uses more advanced modeling. Uh, and whenever I see AI kind of like thrown out in our space, I'm immediately skeptical because I think we haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Uh, you know, we, we talk about, uh, from a debuild perspective, connected commerce, right? And, and what drives that is, you know, a, a very personalized experience for customers. And to, you know, in the retail space, everyone talks about a store of one, right? We talk about a bank of one, personalized banking. And to really achieve that, right, it's all got to be built on top of a foundation of analytics. And I think today, you know, to your point, I think a large portion of the analytics we have and that underlying capability is around kind of the operations with inside the enterprise. And as we look at, you know, the next one to two years, I see that really expanding much, much broadly around, hey, I know inside of a bank, you know, how much money is being spent, how many transactions, the average size of a transaction, et cetera. But now also from a retail perspective, I might also know a lot more about that individual consumer that I can bring to deliver highly relevant information to that consumer. So, so we envision a world where, you know, based on you know, me walking onto a car, a car lot, right, my bank might know, hey, I understand what his purchasing behaviors are. I understand the profile of an individual. I understand um, you know, credit worthiness and, and, and the like. I understand online activities that I've, I've been taking. And based on all of that, I, they also understand all my financial information as well. So could they send me via push notification and say, hey, we know you're on the BMW dealership right now. Here's a pre-approval for your auto loan, right? So trying to simplify, again, remove that friction, but all driven by data across a number of different channels. So I don't think we're there yet, right? But I think, you know, that's, that's the world I think that we're moving towards in the next, next year or two. There's yep. a lot of innovation happening to allow that uh, it, to go on at the point of sale more and more often through things like uh, mobile wallets becoming more ubiqu ubiquitous out in the field. People are using them more often and more frequently. Um, it gives us the ability at the point of sale to recognize that customer and reward them for that same type of interaction where we know on the back end that they're buying you know, Starbucks at a Starbucks kiosk and then we could potentially send them a coupon to buy you know, beans at the grocery store a day or two later. Mm -hmm. that, kind of, that kind of innovation and uh, 
back-end loyalty consumer interaction is already happening in the real world. So, right. you know, certainly artificial intelligence is emerging quickly and evolving. Yep. Jeff, question for you specifically. As we move to become more of a cashless society, do ATMs go away? <laughs> This is the digital money forum, right? <laughs> we can um, only hope. No, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, certainly we, we are we're <clears> definitely <throat> moving to more of a cashless society. I think, you know, digital payments are up. We're seeing greater adoption of, uh, you know, Android Pay, Apple Pay, and the like. However, I, I think, you know, we, we also have to be a little cautious with that statement, right? Because people have been kind of, um, you know, foretelling the, the death of cash for 50 years, right? You know, it started when we started to introduce credit cards, and then when it was online transactions and the like. I mean. I still see, you know, a massive amount of cash in our society for the next, you know, 10 to 15 years, right? I think it's going to be a huge part of our lives. It's, it's easy to carry. Uh, it's still anonymous. It's widely accepted. And I just think, you know, we're going to continue to see that as, uh, as, as, uh, as we go forward. But absolutely no doubt what will grow much, much faster uh, and exponentially so is our, our capability around, around digital payments. Yep. So each of you are really disrupting a, a bit of a legacy industry. Can you talk about working with partners that come from a more of a legacy mindset that may not be as, as quick and easy to adopt new technologies and sort of the, the challenges of working in that environment? I'm happy to jump in there. The vending industry is uh, traditionally uh, very slow moving on technology. And, um, 15, 15 to 18 years ago when we started out in this space with this crazy idea that you should be able to accept credit cards at the point of sale, people were laughing at us. Um, they, they couldn't understand that monthly recurring fee to, to accept um, credit cards. Now it's, it's not even a question. The, the question is whether or not they're connecting 100% of their machines. And the question isn't even do I, do I put technology on my machine just to accept credit cards. Now the, the baseline requirement is that it accept credit and debit, and that we can layer on additional things like mobile wallets. We have the largest installed base of NFC in the country and probably the world, um, which allows us this ability to really understand the arc of mobile wallets. We've seen participation in the very low 1% in the beginning, and we see tremendous growth in the last like two years. Um, so keep your eye out for more information about that. But as we, as we continue to move along, you'll see additional um, opportunities to, to grow in the digital space as far as point of sale collection. Now that every single machine has the opportunity to incorporate the payment right at the point of sale. And that way, kind of freeing up everybody on the back end to have more authentic conversations um, in, in brands. In addition to our direct-to-consumer business, we have a bit over 400 RIA firms who are using our technology to manage clients' assets. Uh, and so they opt to use us because we replace multiple pieces of software that they previously used. We'll handle all the client onboarding. We'll do all the statements. We'll do the entire portfolio management. We'll do all the statements. Uh, so we really take a lot <laughs> off their plate uh, that they had to do both manually and then through other pieces of software. And what we're seeing in those firms is that it's freeing up people to spend more time with clients rather than back office activity, which makes them more productive within their firms because there's often been a misconception that uh, we would displace advisors. And I think the advisors are seeing a greater shift towards financial planning rather than just portfolio management. Yeah, we see the same thing on the, on the banking side as well. A lot of uh, shifting responsibilities, you know, moving from you know, more of a, a teller type of interaction to trying to automate that inside of a branch, you know, and, and you get more of a technology focus inside, you know, the employee base inside the branch versus, you know, the actual traditional teller interactions, you know, may, maybe sitting in a remote call center or a central location. But then when you also see is kind of this shift with, you know, what's actually taking place inside the branch. It's not a transactional destination anymore. It's more of an engagement center where I can educate customers, I can talk about financial planning, I can deal with complex customer service issues. And so the skill sets and the roles are starting to shift uh, as, as, as we see that trans those transformations take place. Yep. I think that makes a lot of sense when you think about the fact that you know, the population asks to be educated more and more often and they want to go online and do their research before they come in and realize that this isn't something that they can resolve on their own like through you know, online portals and things like that, then they can come in and have a face-to-face -face interaction.
connections, so there's always that opportunity. We found that national brands across the country, brands like um, we have a partner with a company called Minute Key um, that cuts keys. It has a kiosk and there's lasers and you go in and you get your keys cut. Cutting a key costs, what, $2, $3 each? Um, but in the past, companies like Home Depot and Lowe's had to allocate a person to sit in the back and spend 10 minutes cutting the key four times or whatever. Um, now they locate these kiosks in the back of Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever, um, and they, they can do this interaction in a couple of minutes through the machine, pay at the point of sale, but you sh you're still adding services to that portfolio and freeing up your, your human resources to really have those good conversations for the higher, more profitable items in the store. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> so I wanted to, to spend a couple of minutes talking about automation's impact on society. And I think there's really two schools of, of thought here. One is that technology creates new jobs, creates more opportunity, and others who think technology is going to eat all of the jobs. Um, I'm curious for each of you what, what your experience has been in your respective industries and how you see the, the trend moving forward. Well, similar to, to what I had just articulated, I, I see the shift in terms of function that's taking place and that's impacting people and the skill sets. Um, you know, you get more of a sales focus kind of inside the branch as opposed to that transactional teller interaction. But then I think it, it's also creating higher value capabilities um, around, you know, the technology needs uh, to serve these customers as well. So a lot of banks are, are investing in different types of technologies. So I think that's, um, I'll say, improving, you know, the, 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 the technical skill sets that, that these banks need. And then I also see kind of a shift where a lot of these more legacy institutions are, are needing to innovate from the outside their own organizations, right? Rather than try and identify how do I build or create something internally, they're starting to now consume services of, of other providers in order to create those capabilities for those customers. And that's, that's creating a higher value skill set you know, inside these institutions. Yeah, I think we've seen a shift, I mentioned it earlier, uh, in a lot of firms where we're able to automate kind of the entire back office manual processes for them. They've been able to, to grow quite a bit quicker and kind of like redeploy internal folks and then actually hire more people. Another thing that we've been able to do is really lower the barrier for them to serve clients. So oftentimes you'll see a lot of firms, they'll typically have a $500,000, maybe a million dollar, maybe it's 250 minimum. And that minimum is typically there because they don't know how to serve clients profitably at a lower level. Uh, and by really lowering their costs and automating things internally, they are able to lower that minimum, sometimes to zero. Uh, we've seen quite a bit in firms, and so then they're able to bring on more new clients as well and grow with them, rather than try to acquire them at a later stage. Yeah, and unattended, I mean, we, we have traditionally not had a lot of interaction at the point of sale, but we really, we really see the automation and the evolving technology as a complement to what's happening out there um, and, and really allowing um, retailers to use their human resources for more authentic interactions. <clears throat> there's no doubt there's a need for that. I, I think we've all walked into stores lately and found you could use a little more customer support. Um, so with our, our last couple of minutes here, I just wanted to quickly ask, what's one thing that you and or your company believe that is probably counterintuitive to most of the people in this audience today? Well, um, there was a really interesting study that was done by Bain and Company, uh, it wasn't too long ago, but they were looking at uh, financial services institutions, uh, specifically retail banks, and trying to understand the consumer experience. And one thing that they found was that the, um, the, the, there was a, a, I think individuals were three times more likely to switch banks, you know, if they frequented branches, right? And so you think about that, that's really kind of a counterintuitive experience. You know, if I'm interacting in a branch, I've got a friendly human vo face and voice across, like, uh, across the counter, I can ask them anything I want. So it's kind of intuitive, when they, when they, counterintuitive. And when they started to dig into that, what they uncovered is that that same experience as compared to the same digital interaction was actually twice as likely to annoy that same customer, right? So if you think about it, if I'm going to deposit a check, I can do that on my, on my mobile app, right? It's very structured, very seamless, quick and easy. I don't have to drive there. I don't have to stay in line. I, who knows what kind of day the person across the counter was actually having, right? And so that, I think, is a, a very counterintuitive, and it's really driving this shift towards self-service capabilities, seamless interactions, and digital experiences. 
There's been a long-standing belief in our space, and I think it's still present today, that the only customers that, that want to use a service like ours are, are really young and beginning investors. Uh, we had a belief pretty early on that everybody would want something like this. That would be a better customer experience, it'd be more transparent and lower cost. Uh, so we invested pretty early in building out products, even for clients in retirement. Uh, so today, more than 30% of the assets come, come from customers over 50. Uh, we have no minimum of betterment, so we have clients who are just starting out, but we also have clients who have more than $10 million with us. So it really does run the, run the full spectrum. Uh, we've got clients in their 70s, 80s, 90s. We hear from customers. Uh, we hear from 40-year-old customers whose parents actually refer them to betterment. Uh, so that's, I think that's pretty counterintuitive for most folks. From our perspective, you know, the counterintuitive thing would probably be around what is sold in self-service unattended retail. For many years, it was always, you know, candy bars and snacks and sodas and things like that. But now, you know, all of us have been to the airport and seen the Best Buy kiosks and the Benefit kiosks. You're finding micro markets jumping up in uh, businesses all across the country. You'll you'll find as as technology evolves, more and more opportunities to bring these tailored, targeted items right to the places where people work um, and, and really keep up with the, um, with the needs for them and make sure that you're bringing the, t the right products to the point of sale at the right time. <clears throat> so last question before I'll open it up to the audience. How far away are we from a future where from a retail standpoint, you never actually need to leave your house. Everything is delivered to you, whether it's via a, a, a drone, a self-driving car, et cetera, and the need to actually walk out and purchase a product no longer exists. Um, you know, it, it, that's hard to say. I personally would not like that world. <laughs> you know, like I, I am a tactile person. There are things that I love having delivered to my door, but there's other things that I want to go and look at and see and touch. So, you know, for me, I think the big change is going to be when you start going into a retailer and seeing, you know, a shirt that you like and then the salesperson can pull up on the app next to you and say, well, these are pants that go with it, and here's a tie, and here's like a, a full outfit. And if you look over in this screen over here, it's gonna show you what you'd look like in it. These are the kind of things that are emerging with the technology and giving you the ability to you know, say, okay, I wanna purchase it right now, and then have it delivered to your house. So I think yeah. that there's going to be a kind of a amalgamation. I agree. I think it depends on the product. I think the more commodity types of products, the ones that are easier to ship as well, right? Those types of things is kind of a click and deliver, right? I think the, the other aspects we can talk about, like fashion retailers, specialty retailers, there is more of that personal interaction. I want maybe an opinion of this person in store. I want to see and look and feel that, that clothing item and so forth. And I think those types of things were, were much farther away uh, on that side. And then we also see a lot too now, you know, kind of that convergence of kind of the, the online and the digital versus the in-store experience. So it's, you know, hey, maybe I want to do kind of a, a click type of transaction online, but then go collect that, you know, inside the store. And I still have a chance to maybe try on that outfit before I actually leave the store, but I actually made the purchase decision in, through an online or digital channel, right? So I think those sorts of things now are starting to, we're starting to see more and more of those click and collect type transactions. Yeah. You, you, I, mean, I think I kind of live that life now. I mean, I don't. What's that? I think I kind of live that life now, right. <laughs> uh, having basically everything delivered. And maybe there's a brand like a Bonobos where you go in the store, but you can't actually buy anything in the store. You just can look at it and say, like, I'll take that. And you, they let you use their laptop. Uh, but a personal preference. I don't. I think I, th that option is there now in some markets. Obviously, not everywhere in the country. It's it's definitely true. I think there's a lot of products people thought would never be purchased digitally. That including things like cars that now is pretty commonplace. So it, it doesn't seem that far away. You talked about clothing, you know, there's companies like Stitch Fix where you get it delivered to you, you try it on, if you don't like it, you send, send it, it back. back. And so they're, they're kind of mm -hmm. disrupting that, that retail experience you mentioned. Do you think, um, you, you mentioned that you'll stand there with a, a stylist in the store. Will that be a human stylist or a virtual uh, yeah, stylist? Yeah, I actually more like, do, I, <clears throat> I do believe that it, that goes back to how I, I believe that um, this point of sale interaction will become a complement to these more authentic interactions. People always will seek out other people. There are always going to be opportunities and 
a place in the world for, for a really good salesperson, for somebody who really understands the products and can have a conversation about it. Um, it, it it's a balancing act, and, and we're finding ways to really complement technology and human interaction in ways that have never before been possible. Yep, great. So with that, I wanted to open it up to the audience uh, for any questions with the few minutes that we have left. So uh, hopefully it's an easy question. So uh, with uh, what what I was going on, like uh, we, I think about the eco Ecofax incident and also the Yahoo account, which have every single email account being compromised. Are you guys worrying about uh, this type of thing for your account? And also. Um, uh, what would be, if you have to speculate, what would be the tipping point that people have to seek uh, fundamental new solutions? And if, uh, if there's a tipping point, what would that be the tipping point? Is that clear? Um, the question, is that clear? I think the, the first part of the question was about data protection, essentially. Yeah. Do you worry about people sure. hacking into your respective databases and, and taking yes. customer data. Yeah, I, I think security is always paramount. I think, you know, 2017 especially, you know, here in the U.S., we saw a large number of breaches, um, not the least of which was, uh, you know, some of the, the credit services companies as well, right? So, um, you know, security is definitely not something that's being taken lightly by, by any means. When it comes to things like self-service devices, we're looking at new ways to authenticate, right? So instead of you know, a touch keyboard that can have an overlay or skimming device placed or a magnetic stripe, a magnetic card reader that can have a skimming device placed, right? We're looking at things like facial recognition, NFC authentication, Bluetooth authentication, any type of biometrics, fingerprints, finger vein, et cetera. So I think those protections are important. And then, you know, also built into the applications, we're seeing a, a lot of protections around uh, those types of capabilities as well. So again, in the case of a, a mobile application that I'm speaking to, I might say, hey, I need to wire money. Right? And that application might go, okay, how much? Well, I'm going to wire 100 bucks to Matt. And it might say, okay. But if it says, hey, I'm, maybe if I want to wire $500 or $1,000, it might say, well, I, now we need step up authentication. So now let's use a, a voice recognition or voice authentication for that, that type of capability. So we see it within the applications, those protections being very important, as well as you know, through those physical experiences. There's nothing I think more important for us and our customers than trust, and we know that we don't get, uh, we're not going to get a free pass if, if something would happen. So we invest pretty heavily in it. Uh, I think there are better security options out there that more banks and financial services providers could be using. Probably the best example is a read-only password. Uh, so if you're a Betterment customer and you want to aggregate your account someplace else or link it, uh, we'll give you a read-only password so you're not actually sharing a password that you could execute anything within the account in the event that that third party has a breach. Uh, more banks should be adopting that. I think consumer data is also probably the biggest war in 2018 in fintech. Uh, we're seeing a lot of banks who are also seeing an opportunistic side of this uh, to potentially restrict data access to third parties for clients, uh, which is pretty problematic because a lot of people want to use a third party for account analysis, for increased transparency. Uh, and we're seeing banks look at and using security uh, kind of like as their, as their defense mechanism for, for restricting that access. Uh, and the CFPB was being very active on this uh, up until recent. Uh, and then there are other kind of organizations and companies too that are really working to try to push uh, access to consumer data and make that actually really guaranteed for, for clients. So security has been a huge concern for us like from the very beginning because most of our point of sales are you know, in remote locations, there's nobody paying attention. Uh, they certainly would present a target if they weren't secure. So we have um, grown our technology around this core tenant of security, um, making sure that everything is, is completely uh, encrypted right from the point of swipe. Um, but that being said, technology is moving quickly, and that's one of the reasons why I see mobile wallets becoming more and more prevalent at the point of sale. Um, by incorporating that biometric um, authorization, you're taking security to an, another level. I mean, 
I, I've had uh, a lot of conversations with um, people about mobile wallets, and there's, there's a common misconception that it's not secure, that, that you're using your phone and somehow somebody's going to be able to get access to your credit card through your phone. But think about it. If you were going to walk away from your money, what would you rather leave on the table when you walk out of this room? Would you prefer to leave your phone or your wallet? I mean, if you leave your wallet, somebody's taking your cash and somebody can walk into the next room and start charging on your credit card. But if you leave your phone, you can go in online and wipe it. I mean, it's, it's a much more secure scenario. And as te technology evolves, and especially as millennials come of age and digital natives start to become uh, bigger players in, in the marketplace, you'll find that more and more people will be using that type of technology simply for the security proposition. Yep. You mentioned data portability, which I think is a, a critical topic. I'm sure they'll talk a lot about that this afternoon as, as part of the blockchain panels. Yes, we have a question over there. Thank you. Um, just wanted to ask Jeff and Amelia about this. So on, the, on the biometric portion of it, I think one of the things that I've always been concerned about is that when you take a biometric piece of information and then you digitize it, it essentially becomes a unique identifier, and it's one that you can't change, right? Your face doesn't really change that much, your fingerprint doesn't change that much. So it's basically a social security number that you can't change, rather than, you know, say a credit card number that you can change. And so I wonder, you know, when we're using all these biometric devices, why not have something where it's also tied to information that can be modified, so that if there were some large breach and the, um, the information that was tied to your thumbprint, right, which has already been digitized. Now, if that's out there and you can't change your thumbprint, well, anyone else can use that as well, right? So I'm, I guess I'm, I'm wondering around the biometric piece, is there a way to tie it into something that can be updated and modified rather than just a single unique identifier that can't be? Thanks. Well, it's an interesting question. I, I, I haven't really thought about it that way. I think, you know, the, the promise of biometrics is actually the fact that it cannot change, right? I think. You know, with a credit card number, it's, it's easy for someone to get a credit card number. It's then, you know, can be utilized online by someone else who just has my information and doesn't, doesn't know me or who I am. But I think the fact that, you know, hey, if I need a facial recognition inside my application to conduct a transaction, it's, you know, this is the one and only face, right? If I need a, a fingerprint to do that, the one and only fingerprint. If I need voice authentication, one and only voice, right? Or some combination of all three, right? And so I think by, but by structuring it that way, I think you actually have far greater security than, than you would, uh, you know, with, with something that is uh, fungible, if you will, in terms of a credit card number that can be changed. And keeping in mind when you're, when you're linking it with information that you have on something like a smartphone device, then, then you do have the opportunity to update and associate with different cards or whatever. Um, uh, I, I would agree with you, though. I mean, when it comes to biometrics and facial recognition, you know, the advantage is that it doesn't change. I, I think you're, you're right, though, that we've trusted companies for so long, both, both implicitly and explicitly with our data, that they're going to use it for good to enhance consumer experiences. And, uh, you know, I think there is some, some danger there. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, but thank you all so much for all of your great insight. I, I hope you. everyone enjoyed and uh, move on to the next crew. Thank you. Right, thank you.